Welcome to Jamestown, Williamsburg, and the Virginia Frontier. This is Melinda Cole Klein. While trade and commerce became the economic basis of New England, this was not the case in Virginia. In the southern royal colony, the economy and to a large extent the culture remained geared to a single agricultural crop and this would be tobacco. Williamsburg, Virginia's capital from 1700 to the beginning of the American Revolution, lacked the busy, hustle-bustle, commercial atmosphere of Boston or Philadelphia. In comparison with New England, Virginia seemed well suited for agriculture and colonization. In time, the Virginia colony would expand into the frontier and move its capital from Jamestown to Williamsburg. Early in the 1600s, when England began to establish permanent settlements, Virginia was vaguely defined as the area north of the Spanish Florida and situated on the Chesapeake Bay. While Virginia had many rivers that could offer good transportation, the land, first of all, was infested with mosquitoes and it had swamp lands and ponds that could cause illness and death by malaria. Early death for the colonists came to thousands who ended up living near the coast. All things considered, Virginia was well suited for agriculture if a sustainable labor force could be had by the early settlers wishing to create a profit in this fruitful land. The soil was richest along the many rivers, while the climate was mild most of the year. Virginia had a relatively long growing season with hot though humid summers and it had plenty of rainfall. In addition, game existed to include a variety of wild birds, fish, wild deer, and beavers. Such resources allowed English colonists to venture into the fur trade, a monopoly that had been held by the French and Dutch to the north of them. Dense forests reached near to the edge of rivers and the coast offering a great ready source of lumber for building, fuel, and export, while in later decades allowing planters to load and receive goods from ships docking to their own property. Sir Walter Raleigh eventually transferred his right to establish a colony to a group of London merchants. Out of this grew two joint stock companies. First, the Virginia Company of London and Plymouth that were granted a charter to establish colonies on April 10, 1601 by King James I. The London Company, also known as the Virginia Company, sent out three ships and 104 colonists on December 20, 1606 a bad time of the year to be sailing. They did not arrive in Virginia until April 26, 1607. Secondly, the Plymouth Colony that would follow the Jamestown settlement in 1607 uh, with their destination of Maine, this colony was actually a failure. During the first year of settlement, there were no women in Jamestown. The colonists in 1607 were a mixed bag of adventurers who were there to make money quickly. These early colonists were not interested in creating permanent buildings or constructing a fort. Largely, they were looking for furs and gold. In their occupations, there was a range from gentlemen who possessed no practical skills in colonial projects two soldiers, carpenters, bricklayers, a tailor, barber, and a blacksmith. There was only one clergyman, a surgeon, and a young boy. 
The first governor sent to establish the colony was Captain John Smith. He was 27 years old at the time. He was the son of an English tenant farmer, so a commoner by birth. Ten years earlier, he was a soldier of fortune and had fought uh, in England's war against the Spanish in the Netherlands. Smith's early accounts of Jamestown remain the following three books. True Relation, published in 1608, The General History of Virginia, New England, and the Summer Isles, uh, and then followed by uh, True Travels and Observations, so 1624 and 1630. In these texts, he recounted many daring deeds that he had performed, thus creating uh, a vision of himself, perhaps. Historians debate even today how much truth is contained within uh, Smith's accounts that were published at the time. Case in point uh, is the story of his rescue by the Indian maiden Pocahontas from death at the hands of her father, Powhatan. Smith did not mention the event in A True Relation, published shortly after it supposedly happened, while thankfully other colonists' diary entries that have survived uh, tell a more accurate view of history and early settlement. Captain John Smith was a bit of a prickly character. He was known to be impetuous, headstrong, and disliked taking orders or suggestions from others. He was known to uh, steal food stores during the starving years from the Powhatan Indians. He had been active in the founding of the Virginia Company, and without him the new colony might not have survived during its early two first years. What did the colonists do? Most of the first colonists preferred to search for gold rather than work. They had no desire to clear land, plant gardens, build a fort, or guard against Indian attacks. Finally, colonists realized they would have to plant and cultivate their own winter stores if they expected to survive till spring. Smith wrote to the Virginia Company owners pleading for colonists experienced in fishing, farming, and practical labors. Jamestown was situated poorly and also planned poorly. It was built on a low, swampy, and sandy island peninsula on the James River, located on the Chesapeake Bay. However, after taking advice of the company, they did not settle near the open ocean, but into the interior. It lay about 30 miles from the mouth of the Chesapeake, where it meets the Atlantic Ocean water. One of Jamestown's few advantages was that ships could be tied to the trees along the river's bank. It was an unhealthy spot, though, full of mosquitoes in the summer. In time, this indefensible, sandy spit of land surrounded by water, the Jamestown colonists built a flimsy fort that offered only little protection from Indian raids. Many colonists preferred to live in a state of permanent camping-like conditions. They lived in tents instead of building sturdier shelters. Lastly, whatever food supplies they brought with them from England spoiled in this climate. As a result of climate and local conditions, combined with the lack of food that caused malnutrition, Jamestown incurred, sadly, a heavy death rate that continued for decades. In the early years from 1607 through the winter of January 1608, only 38 colonists out of the original 104 had survived. While in charge, Smith reminded colonists that all the power rested with him and that they must obey now. He continued on to include 
that he that would not work shall not eat, except by sickness that he is disabled. The following year, Smith uh, returned to England due to illness himself. He recovered but did not return to Jamestown. He decided to write about his experiences instead. In 1609, the Virginia Company was reorganized and granted a new charter. This document stripped the Jamestown colonists and the council of its powers, and they became advisors instead. With subsequent charters in 1612 and 1618, Virginia encouraged agricultural pursuits while turning a profit for the company financiers. But this took years. Colonists starved or barely subsisted until 1612. With the return of more colonists and the inability to turn a profit in these early years, the company was in debt. By 1618, the company had poured more than $10 million in today's money into the settlement without receiving any return on their investment. In the years prior to John Rolfe's arrival in Jamestown, John Smith's unproductive meetings with the Powhatan natives provide an insight that the colonists, if not begging, were stealing food. While stealing had occurred, Smith traded with Indians for tobacco, and this product ultimately became the basis upon which Virginia was to thrive. But the tobacco native to Virginia was disliked by Europeans. They preferred the sweeter, more fragrant tobaccos successfully grown in the Spanish islands in the Caribbean. Until seeds of this tobacco were successfully grown in Virginia soil, a number of commodities were attempted for export, but none proved valuable enough to make the colony self-sustaining. The first cargo of goods as freight to be shipped from Jamestown consisted of sassafras and cedar plants, uh, including herbs and timber, iron pyrite that was sent as gold, but discovered as such and was a fraud. Famine swept through Jamestown on and off from 1607 through 1610. In 1610, the vessel's deliverance and the patience finally arrived at Jamestown with expected supplies. However, instead of supplies, the vessels brought 60 colonists. Jamestown residents were angered but pitied the new arrivals because of local conditions. John Rolfe was one of the 1610 colonists who had arrived a little bit later on aboard the Sea Venture that had wintered out, unlike the previous arrivals, in Bermuda. Unknown to anyone, he had smuggled out of the Caribbean prized tobacco seeds. In 1611, when he arrived in Jamestown, he introduced the Spanish type of tobacco seeds as an agricultural experiment. With the arrival indentured servants, these are British laborers who were under contract, and this tobacco strain, Jamestown was saved. By 1612, Jamestown had its first crop of tobacco. But it would be months after harvest and curing to know how well it would be received on the English market. About this time, Rolf's wife died. She had lost their child and never fully recovered from the sea voyage. In 1614, Rolf married an Indian girl, then 18 years old, whom John Smith would later credit as having saved his life. Pocahontas, Powhatan's favorite daughter, had been, well, they called it kidnapped by Jamestown colonists, at least according to the chief, and held as a hostage to prevent Indian attacks upon the English settlement. Apparently, Pocahontas preferred life in the English colony to that of her own village. She converted to Christianity and was baptized Rebecca when her romance with Rolf developed. He wrote the Virginia Company governor for permission to marry the Indian princess. Permission was granted 
and they were married in a great ceremony attended by a number of natives also. In effect, Rolf was the economic and political savior of the colony. That first crop of tobacco grown in Jamestown was well received by London buyers. Pocahontas and Rolf had a son they named Thomas in 1615, and in 1616 the planter and his Indian bride sailed for England aboard a ship carrying more tobacco. Pocahontas became the rage of London. She was often the guest of honor at parties, but in 1617 she caught a flu, although some historians say it was smallpox, and she died. In the same year, Jamestown colonists were shipping 50,000 pounds of tobacco to England. Some say a value with an estimated worth in today's money equal to millions of dollars. Rolf left his son in England to receive an education, returned to Jamestown, and married again, this time to a daughter of one of the colonists. Until his death in 1622, he became quite active in Jamestown politics and continued his efforts to improve the quality of tobacco grown in Virginia. With tobacco, the Virginia colony was a success. New settlements developed as tobacco planters cleared land up the peninsula and began to move inland up from the river. As the English colonists continued to encroach on native hunting grounds, Along with other factors, this caused tensions to increase between the colonists and the Algonquian-speaking natives in Virginia. Problems continued to plague the early Jamestown colonists in Virginia. In 1617, Jamestown was hit with smallpox. Smallpox introduced by European explorers and colonists raged through New England and spread south to Virginia, where it killed the Powhatan chief and many of his tribesmen. Disease constituted another of Jamestown's problems. New settlers brought with them scurvy, the plague, and various tropical diseases such as yellow fever contracted in Bermuda and other Caribbean islands. In addition, it has been estimated that half of every shipload of new settlers came down with malaria, pneumonia, or dysentery after landing in Virginia. Of those taken ill, most died. In 1618, wheat growing was attempted in Virginia. It proved to be a success alongside the planting of tobacco. But unlike wheat, tobacco proved to be labor-intensive. While British indentured servants died by the hundreds soon after arrival, acquiring a stable labor force was seen as problematic and there was no end in sight. Soon, Virginia planters took the advice of the successful West Indian Dutch sugar planters regarding their labor issues. This led to the importation of the colony's first black laborers while British indentured servants continued to pour into Virginia settlements. Another glaring problem was that many of the early settlers and indentured servants had been recruited from the slums and jails of London. This continued for decades leading to the disorderly character so well known and associated with early Virginia. In time, the recruiting of Virginia settlers came under the control with planning and reorganization under the direction of Governor William Berkeley from 1642 until 1676. So the building of Virginia's elite planter society really begins from the distressed Cavaliers founding families of Virginia, second sons from noble English families that would create a sustainable Virginia plantation economy. According to legend, Jamestown farmers were convinced that blacks were resistant to malaria. 
In addition, they wouldn't die as easily, didn't run away because they were easily detected within the general population, worked strong and hard, were not Christians, therefore they did not deserve equal treatment, and could not appeal to home governments to improve their lot in life. 357 out of approximately 1,100 settlers were dead as a result of the Indian Massacre that took place on March 22, 1622. John Rolfe was killed in the attack. The residents of Jamestown escaped the slaughter, having been put on alert by a friendly Indian boy. Too many whites lived in Virginia by 1622 to be completely wiped out. But whites did take their revenge. A year later, colonists worked out a truce with the Powhatan natives and proposed a toast using liquor laced with poison. 200 Indians died as a result of the poisoning and 50 more were killed. After 1619, the quality somewhat improved regarding the type of indentured servants coming to Virginia. While independent craftsmen and skilled artisans brought with them their habits, customs, and traditions of the English villages, they continued to be oftentimes an unruly bunch which led to internal problems. In 1624, the Virginia Company lost its charter because it went bankrupt. At this point, the Virginia colony became a crown colony. After the 1622 attack and the internal problems, the crown took over the settlement. Governing now would come from the king. In time, Janestown would repeatedly catch on fire and be indefensible. Jamestown was eventually abandoned as the capital of Virginia at the end of the century when it was moved to Williamsburg in 1699. And unlike the bustling seaport towns of Middle or New England, Williamsburg was not a year-round residential center for wealthy planters. It was a center of occasional society and cultural use. Unlike Jamestown, Williamsburg was built on high ground. Its location lay between two major rivers, but not on them. This choice of venue offered builders and city planners the opportunity to lay out the city in regards to ease of movement, its beauty, and to highlight its fine buildings, necessary to a capital. For more than 30 years, Governor Sir William Berkeley had served Virginia. He took office in 1642 and by the 1660s there was rapid population growth in Virginia and land was becoming scarce while weak treaties kept an uneasy peace with local Indians. Especially in Virginia, unless a scandal had caught the attention of other planters, Politicians typically were re-elected year after year. Thus, settlers on the Virginia frontier were underrepresented. Resentment by 1676 was the result. Governor Berkeley had achieved a high level of political control in England and Virginia by 1670. The same year, he restricted suffrage only to men with property. This narrowed political action and unwanted voices of the discontented and disenfranchised in government. This included men who had been former indentured servants, transported convicts, the underemployed, and others who likely held grudges against the planter class in general. In addition, this group would not see eye to eye with this traditional style of elitist control so familiar at home. But new treaties with frontier Indians appeased farmers from time to time. In 1676, Nathaniel Bacon led a revolt against the colonial elite. Out on the Virginia frontier, the Tidewater elites ensured only inadequate protection 
against Indian attacks. This illustrated to frontiersmen their colonial government had failed them. To Bacon, Berkeley's government did not honor their promises of protection and recognition. Bacon proposed to Berkeley to organize a volunteer army of backcountry frontiersmen to do their own fighting, arming themselves against Indian attacks. The offer was rejected by the governor. Bacon went ahead anyway with his plan and created a frontier militia. Berkeley labeled the fighters rebels. Bacon used his frontier militia to lead a rebellion against Berkeley. To this end, Bacon succeeded in burning down much of Jamestown. But Bacon died shortly after. Activities in Williamsburg and the great Tidewater plantation houses east of the mountain range represented only one side of life in colonial Virginia. Above the falls marking the western edge of the Tidewater lay the frontier, the foothills, the Blue Ridge Mountains, and the western valleys beyond the mountains. In the Tidewater region with its large plantations, society had become stratified. At the top was the successful tobacco planters, a local aristocracy. Next were the clergymen, merchants, smaller farmers, and planters and artisans. Then wage laborers, indentured servants, and slaves at the bottom of the social ladder. Here, landowners rich and of the middling gentry class worked their own land. Very few had indentured servants, wage laborers, or slaves. This was partly because slavery was uneconomical on small farms and required an outlay of cash on demand of purchase. There were religious as well as political and economic differences between Tidewater and frontier Virginians. A number of Scots, Irish, Scots-Irish, Germans and Dutch had settled the frontiers of the southern colonies and very few of them were members of the Anglican Church. Many were Presbyterians, Methodists, and Baptists. Frontier families demanded freedom of worship to their governor, claiming this right already in effect in England. The Anglican Church, state-funded and with required attendance, offered frontier people few services as churches were scarce and their ideas, if and when offered by the few clergy and residents, promoted an elitist view of life and a class-based society. In addition, frontier churches were converting slaves by the 1740s, a controversial idea across Anglican Virginia. The government considered this an attack on their authority. Revivalist preachers spread ideas among frontier people that their government was corrupt and elitist. Many blacks in bondage saw this new religion and its views on the established colonial culture as a road to freedom. Dissenters in Virginia were largely along the frontier but extreme groups such as the Quakers were never welcomed in any colony. They were religious anarchists. They had no minister and little former organization. They removed their hats to no one, and this included political as well as religious figures. They recognized no God-given rights to superiority among men or churches. They hated war and they hated slavery and only hanging would close their mouths about their beliefs. In time, the stocks and pillory, or slicing off a Quaker ear or two, sentenced them to silence. In time, the Virginia Assembly compared Quakers to rotten apples. As early as 1660, they passed laws against them regarding assembly and practicing their faith which would result in imprisonment without bail and required them to leave Virginia at the earliest time. Quakers could not publish books, 
their sermons, pamphlets, or any tenets containing their opinions. The Mapping of Virginia Surveyors were appointed low-level bureaucrats employed across the colonies. Cartographic draftsmen and surveyors' main function was to establish an accurate map for the purposes of determining land rights, legal boundaries, and most important for calculating property taxes. Previous attempts to correctly map Virginia had failed. Surveyors kept ledgers as they traveled the colony. Final copies went back to the capital for interpretation, legal recording, and taxation purposes. In 1751, the map of Virginia was completed by Peter Jefferson and Tom Fry. In 1754, with his post served as colonial surveyor, Peter Jefferson became a member of the House of Burgesses. He died with Thomas at a time when his son was only 14 years old. Two prominent colonial governors stand out in early Virginian history. First was William Berkeley, who had served in Virginia for decades and is remembered as the instrumental force behind establishing the resident aristocracy in the colony. From an aristocratic background himself, Berkeley successfully made Virginia during the early years as close a symbol of English authority and power as it could have been. Hundreds of his peers established tobacco plantations from the 1640s and following the English Civil Wars until the Restoration by 1660 through 1677. It would be to Governor Berkeley that Nathaniel Bacon took his grievances during the uprising and civil unrest in 1676. It would be during this time in office that Puritans and Quakers experienced the most aggressive prosecution. The Church of England was established in Virginia and dissenters were not welcomed. From 1691 in the provincial period, another notable Virginia governor was Alexander Spotswood. This former military colonel from a Scottish noble family would be the politician from 1710 to 1722. It would be Spotswood that would create Williamsburg as a city of culture and politics. Before he arrived, the building of William and Mary College in Williamsburg established the architectural grace that would lead Virginia to its historic southern plantation building style. England's greatest architect of the time was Sir Christopher Wren and he designed the college halls and much of the campus. One of the many high points of Governor Spotswood career was during the 1710s when piracy came to a head with the violations by Edward Teach, also known as Blackbeard. Under his direction, Governor Spotswood's office hired two vessels to track the Queen Anne's Revenge because these pirates were raiding English merchant vessels. This pinnacle year was 1718, and this brought to a close a chapter of piracy off the Virginia coast. Also, Spotswood is remembered for his efforts to maintain peace in 1721 with the Iroquois from New York, who, under treaty, agreed to stay north of Virginia. Although the wealthy planters grumbled over the colonial tax money spent on the magnificent structure that became the governor's mansion, all were greatly impressed by his architecture, furnishings, and gardens. What did they do? Well, wealthy planters who could afford it copied the style by improving their estates or built houses for their sons in this southern mansion house style. By 1720, the governor's mansion set an architectural standard for southern living. 
By the early 18th century, improved communication allowed Virginians to better contact other colonials. From 1691, a colonial postal service was established by a 21-year royal grant. While other colonies had established postal services since the early time in their settlement years, in Virginia, the mail was typically carried by a slave or a courier or another such private messenger from one plantation to the next. Apparently, the penalty for not passing along the mail to the next plantation carried heavy fines. This system worked well for a while, but required a more modern solution, and the other colonies coincided with the establishment of the colony's first newspaper, the Virginia Gazette. This newspaper tells much about life in Williamsburg, with their advertisements and news reports, such as the latest furnishings recently arrived from London. Trade goods included the sought-after London fine tableware to silverware, crafted in high quality from teaspoons to soup bowls and silver trays for serving. The first theater in America was erected on the public green near the governor's palace, and it was an extremely popular institution. By 1752, the Williamsburg Theater ceased to depend on amateur productions put on by the residents and local college students. The Williamsburg Theater hosted plays for planters and their wives. These acting companies hailed from London and Paris, putting on Shakespearean plays and comedy acts. The Raleigh Tavern was the most popular of the public houses. It served many functions. It was a collection point for the mail going by sea. It was nearly as popular as the Williamsburg Court when it was in session, when justice was delivered and witnessed by all present. Public Times and Williamsburg Amusements the time to enjoy such entertainment coincided with the twice yearly meeting of Virginia's Colonial Assembly, the House of Burgesses, in the fall and spring, to attend the Bruton Church while staying in town. During these public times, as they were called, the residents of Virginia opened their homes graciously to house the many visitors. Planters with businesses traveled with their families. If they owned a townhouse, they would open for the season with political meetings, dinners, and dancing. This would include the cotillion, a formal, intricate dance involving frequent changes of partners. This was favored by the ladies and gentlemen of Colonial Williamsburg. Women visiting Williamsburg spent hours browsing through the shops, examining the latest fashions from London. Men found entertainment in the town's many taverns, talking, drinking, and playing cards and dice, even though the law provided severe penalties for tavern keepers who allowed gambling in their establishments. Fairs were held in Williamsburg at least once a year at either the courthouse or market squares. Here, colonial goods would be for sale. An advertisement in the Virginia Gazette of 1737 reveals activities of horse racing, music competitions, choir singing, along with beauty contests while fair guests were encouraged to behave themselves with becoming sobriety. Church attendance was as much a social as a religious event in Virginia. In Virginia, as in England, the Anglican Church was the established church. Very few Puritans, Catholics, Quakers, or Presbyterians immigrated to Virginia. However, because a resident was not Anglican, this did not excuse them, as a taxpayer, from paying taxes to support the colonial church. All Virginians, even those who were not members, were required to pay taxes for the support of the church until late in the colonial period, 
across the colony's status regulated familiar social customs. Church seating in Virginia was one of those public activities in which you took a seat based on the rank of your family as recognized by others. Politicians and intellectuals sat near the front, possessing family pews. This was followed by those of wealth, influence, and prominence. Those of low or middling status were in the back of the church or up on the balcony. This included average farmers, indentured servants, slaves, and prisoners, along with the students from the College of William and Mary. Because most Virginians lived far apart, unlike in New England, regular church service was difficult. However, when public times were ongoing and families were residing in Williamsburg, all were required to attend. And this also included jailed prisoners who were awaiting sentencing. Time spent in Williamsburg during the public times without a bout made an impression on planters, their ladies, children, and servants. After church parishioners browsed the shops of cabinet makers, leather works, and silversmiths, while reading public notices tacked up on the wall of the courthouse. In addition, they might witness someone in the stocks in the square who had missed several Sundays of church attendance without good reason. On Sunday there were fireworks from the governor's garden, classical music in the air performed by skilled musicians. To a small minority, life in Williamsburg was not so pleasant. And this could be offered in regards to the prisoners who might be awaiting sentencing or execution. Lawbreakers condemned to death were given a few weeks to make their peace with God and could be seen on Sunday mornings walking to the Bruton Parish Church in Williamsburg in their chains accompanied by their jailer. Although justice in colonial America was severe, punishments were carried out promptly. Extended sentencing of prisoners in jail was uncommon. A person found guilty of a minor offense might be sentenced to sit in the stocks for a day in the public square. However, if it was a woman, this would be for a few hours. For capital crimes, the convicted felon was usually not hanged, but could be if deemed appropriate. Public whipping, mutilation, or branding on the hand could be the offered sentence, M for murder, T for thief. Not many people survived long terms of imprisonment. Cells were small, unheated, crowded, lacked uh, sanitary facilities, and the filth and the stench alone was nearly unbearable. Jailed prisoners wore leg irons attached to the floor. Food was either donated or brought by relatives and shoved through small openings in thick walls. Those who could afford it ordered food and drink from the tavern and often shared meals with the poor prisoners. Church members might donate food to those with no resources, but the time a colonist spent in a prison was usually short and he or she did not necessarily starve to death. Imprisonment for debt persisted across the colonies until the 1770s, although debtors were given slightly better treatment than other prisoners. Their cells were heated and their stays were shorter. The jail was one of the first structures to be built in Williamsburg. Pirates were a constant threat to the Chesapeake Bay and along the Atlantic seaboard in general. By the 1710s, the British government, with the sea supremacy of the Navy, took measures to make sea travel for merchant vessels and passengers safer. Capturing resisting pirates or paying them off to retire was the key to this government mission. In 1717, just before the capture of Blackbeard, 
Parliament passed a British law in efforts to put tighter controls on ensuring safety on the high seas and to protect passengers and commerce generally. It was an extension of an earlier act of 1698, targeted to suppress piracy practice within what the British government considered their realm. While pirates were valuable in wartime, as they undermined the effectiveness of foreign naval strength, in peacetime they were broadly unwelcomed. The first likely inmates of the Williamsburg Jail were members of the crew of Captain Edward Teach's pirate ship. Teach was nicknamed Blackbeard from his habit of growing a long beard, braiding it, looping it into fantastic forms, and tying it with a ribbon. He was a notorious buccaneer. Allegedly, he was allowed to prey on ships and towns along the coast of the southern colonies because he shared the booty with the royal governor of North Carolina. Angry Virginia merchants and planters appealed to Governor Spotswood. In 1718, two armed ships were deployed to apprehend the pirate and his crew. As legend has it, Commander Lieutenant Maynard killed Blackbeard in a hand-to-hand -hand combat and hung the pirate's head pitched on a pike from the bow of his ship as he returned to port with 15 of the Queen Anne's Revenge crew. The pirates were tried in Williamsburg. The men were deemed guilty and hanged. Blackbeard was a notorious English pirate who had enjoyed a short reign of terror in the Caribbean Sea between 1716 and 1718. His vessel, the Queen Anne's Revenge, is believed by some to have run aground near Beaufort Inlet, North Carolina, in 1718. Over time, Teach had acquired a rather brutal reputation as a pirate. Since the peace with France from 1713, pirates were no longer needed by the British government. But it is close to impossible to retrain a paid thief. In times of war and later peace, Blackbeard and his men would raid merchant ships, along with other pirates of their time. All of the valuables would be confiscated. While Blackbeard had a tremendous reputation, no accounts could verify he actually killed anyone. Blackbeard himself is believed to have been in retirement when his ship was commandeered by Lieutenant Maynard under orders from Governor Spotswood after he ran aground. According to some historical sources, Blackbeard was attempting to reduce his number of crew by 1718. Anyway, as the Navy had become a formidable impediment to their activities as pirates. Nonetheless, Blackbeard did not live to see his trial, killed on board the Queen Anne's Revenge as he was. Blackbeard, like other pirates, had outlived their usefulness of commandeering Spanish and French frigates for colonial and royal governments while their take of merchant booty went unregulated. Under the Transportation Act of 1718, British convicts served as a source of labor for English plantation owners in the Sugar Islands of the West Indies, the tobacco and rice plantations of the Chesapeake Bay and Carolinas, and to family enterprises along the Atlantic seaboard, such as those in New York and Philadelphia. In some places, it was common to work alongside African slaves. Vagrants to murderers sent to America originated from across the British Isles. Between 1718 and 1775, more than 50,000 British convicts were transported from the British Isles following a court judgment. This might range from seven years to life. Historians of convict transportation agree the number of British convicts sent to America was the largest group 
of individuals to be forced to immigrate to America, second only to slaves from Africa.